about. My name is Ellen Longmire, and I'm Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in CSE. Uh, and I'm happy to MC this competition today. Come on in. Uh, behind me. Um, to get this work. This will work. <laughs> It did work. There we go. Um, well, this is just a little out. I will go through the judging criteria, the rules of the competition. Then you'll see we'll have the presentation. We have 16 contestants today. Um, and once we go through the presentations, the judges will move to a separate room. Uh, and during that time, we'll have what's called the People's Choice Voting, uh, on which we'll give an award. And also during that time, we'll do Q&A for the contestants if you'd like to learn more about uh, their work. And finally, uh, we'll present the awards. So uh, what is this competition? Uh, students have exactly three minutes to present their thesis work. Um, and this competition was open to students across CSE. And I think it has a great purpose, which is multifold. One, uh, they get to tell us about their research, uh, which I am sure is going to be very interesting. And secondly, they get to uh, develop and display uh, their presentation and communication skills. So this year, uh, we're gonna be giving three prizes. Uh, we have a sponsor, PPG Industries, uh, that's supporting this. Uh, and I'd like to thank them very much. You'll see we have a first prize, a runner up, each decided by the judges, as well as the People's Choice Award that will be decided by the audience, including, including those online will be able to vote. Um, and I'll say something about our three judges who are all CSE alums. Uh, so we're really proud to have them here. I think they have all had to date very distinguished careers. First, Chris Burhart, who is a PhD from electrical <clears throat> engineering a few years back. I know had a long and distinguished career. Uh, lastly, the Clotho and Associates, um, second judge, Janelle Paulus, who's from Schwegman, Lundberg, and Wassner, uh, and is an attorney there. Uh, she holds a bachelor's in chemical engineering, and I think is going to have a lot of understanding of uh, various products developed from scientific advances. Uh, and our third judge is Christy Kearney from Polymet Mining. She's the VP for Environmental Affairs and holds a master's degree in civil engineering from uh, CFP. Uh, here are the rules. So each contestant is allowed to present one slide, which is static, uh, and they have three minutes to talk about their work um, using spoken words only, no singing or poetry or rap style. Uh, and the clock will start um, when their slide is first displayed and will be stopped after three minutes. Uh, starts with the voice, it'll be about synchronous, I'll say. Um, and the decision of the judges is final. Uh, what will be judged? So you can see here two categories. Uh, the first is about comprehension and content uh, such that uh, within the content, the students need to address the background and significance of the research, uh, the impact of the research, and they need to make a clear and logical presentation. Uh, the second subcategory here is engagement and communication. Uh, you can see here a number of questions. Uh, did the presenter convey enthusiasm and 
Did they make the audience want to know more about the topic? Uh, did they capture the audience's attention? And um, did their speaking coordinate well with the slide they presented? presented. <laughs> Okay, I think I said already we have 16 contestants and one key point here is the first place uh, winner of this competition will advance to the university wide competition I think it takes place on November 11th, and I think will be extremely competitive. Uh, the winner of the university competition goes on to a national competition. Uh, we will do the people's choice voting after the presentations and provide you time to ask questions. <clears throat> and uh, now I think we're ready for the first contestant. So please come on up. Uh, that will be Tyler Barna, who is from Astrophysics. And the title uh, for his work is Enabling More Productive Astrophysics. Do you want the microphone? Uh, You're all set. Test. Okay. Okay. Oh, right. Wait, it's caught. Ready on the Venus. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I can't. Oh. Whatever. It's fine. All right. All good. All right. So I might be a bit biased, but there's a lot of cool things that happen in space, which is actually kind of a problem. As we develop new ways to observe all of these cool things, uh, we've started to have too much to look at. A thousand years ago, astronomers were limited by what they could see with the naked eye. A hundred years ago, we were starting to develop ways to observe all the radiation our eyes can't see. Today, we have all sorts of telescopes across and even orbiting the globe, and we can see back to near the start of the universe. Our observational capabilities have started to outstrip our ability to actually analyze the data we collect. Further compounding matters is the rapid development of the field of multi-messenger astrophysics. Multi-messenger astrophysics seeks to analyze not just light and radiation, but also more exotic signals. And there's perhaps none more exotic than gravitational waves. These are a consequence of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. To put it simply, their distortions in the fabric of space and time caused by massive objects like black holes colliding into one another. Uh, with their first detection in 2015, which later led to a Nobel Prize, we entered a new era of astronomy. By analyzing the multiple messages a source can emit, we can gain a unique insight into the nature of our universe. However, associating a specific gravitational wave with a given object in the sky is non-trivial, and generally, we have to look at the entire sky for a source that can disappear within a few weeks. This is where my research comes in. Over the past year, I have led development on a pipeline that automatically observes and analyzes data of targets observed in optical wavelengths to determine which are the most likely to be gravitational wave sources. This allows us to continue looking at the most interesting objects. However, I have a lot of aspirations for this project. In the near future, I will be integrating it with an online database called Sky Portal, which will allow the general astronomical community to perform their own analyses, greatly enhancing the scientific return of already collected data. Uh, in the past, it's been difficult to coordinate time-sensitive follow-up observations when gravitational wave detections can occur at any time, and usually collaborations will span continents. Uh, for my pipeline, I will develop it such that it's able to not only automatically analyze light curves, but also automatically trigger follow-up observations with partner telescopes. My work has the potential to significantly increase our understanding of the universe and make significant strides in not just multi-messenger astrophysics, but also astronomy as a whole. Thank you for your time. Creating galaxy evolution from massive outflows.
Yes. In 1990, NASA launched the Hubble Space Telescope 350 miles above the Earth's surface and peered out into the vast reaches of outer space. What this telescope saw would change our understanding of the universe forever. What were once seemingly point-like sources of light now had size, revealing themselves to be collections of billions of stars gravitationally bound together in other galaxies billions of light years away. <laughs> By studying collections of stars at different distances, Hubble is able to study how galaxies evolve. One of the great discoveries of Hubble was realizing that galaxies are not static islands spread throughout the universe, but rather are rich reservoirs of gas and stars which are constantly exchanging material with their surroundings. Um, so, so here in this picture, we're showing um, the different cycles of the flows. So here, outflows are constantly expelling material out of the galaxy, while inflows are constantly bringing it back in. For my PhD thesis, I set out to measure the properties of these flows. By knowing their speed and their mass, we stand to learn a lot about the inner workings of galaxies. Uh, to study flows, all we have at our disposal is the light emitted by the galaxy. As this light passes through the flow, the flow will absorb and re-emit this light, leaving a distinct signature in the observations. Armed with the knowledge of how light behaves here on Earth, I developed a mathematical model to interpret the spectra of these flows called SALT. SALT is able to tell us the distribution of the flow, its mass, and its speed. But here's the catch. How do I know SALT actually works? How do I know I didn't leave out some key physical process from the underlying model? To answer this question, I tested SALT against large computer simulations of galaxies. I found out that turbulence, or the random motion of gas, was a key component missing from the model that was skewing the results. After making the appropriate corrections, SALT is now the first model consistent with simulations for interpreting uh, observations of flows. So what's next? On Christmas Day 2021, NASA launched the James Webb Space Telescope one million miles above the Earth's surface, and once again peered out into the vast outreaches of outer space. As Hubble's successor, Webb is designed to see the first galaxies to have appeared in the universe. With this new data set, I will be able to use SALT to measure the properties of the first galactic outflows to form in the universe for the first time in human history. Thank you. Uh, you hear me now? Yes, good. Okay, when in doubt, turn it on. Little trick we learned. Like in electrical engineering. Okay. <laughs> so in the late 1960s, uh, researchers in Colorado noticed this disease spreading through their white, wild white tailed deer population that was 100% fatal and was spreading really quickly. And they called this disease uh, chronic wasting disease or CWD as I'll refer to it as. And uh, CWD since then has spread all across North America. It's now unfortunately found in Scandinavia and even South Korea. So it's really become a global problem. But why do we care? It's a deer disease, but why do we care? Well, the first off is we wanna be good stewards of our environment. Hopefully, if you don't understand that, come talk to me afterwards. Um, second off, there are tens of billions of dollars associated with the economy around deer in the United States alone. So there's a real economic risk here. And there's also uh, a health risk associated with chronic wasting disease. Uh, we want to limit the potential hazards to human and wildlife health. And so taking a closer look, what's actually going on here? So in the deer uh, cells, what they have is uh, in their neurons and their brains, they have these proteins floating around that have a certain function. But the issue is, is these proteins can break and they, we say they misfold. 
And when they misfold, they actually cause other healthy proteins to come and misfold. And this sets off a chain reaction of all these misfolded proteins that build up in the cell um, that cause the animal to die. Unfortunately, current CWD diagnostics are very limited. So they require really fancy, expensive equipment. Uh, they're time consuming, they're not field deployable. And so they have to be done in these centralized laboratories. But how many of you all know that deer usually aren't in centralized laboratories? Mm -hmm. So this makes it really hard for wildlife management workers to detect this disease. So in my research, what we've done is we have developed a test using something called gold nanoparticles, which all you need to understand about them is they're these tiny spheres of gold that float around in solution. And we'll talk about them a little bit later. But we just talk, we developed this test uh, using gold nanoparticles for chronic wasting disease. And we worked with the Department of Natural Resources to see if it actually works. So we went outside of our laboratory down to southeastern Minnesota, and the DNR would uh, bring us tissues from various deer from the wild white deer population. And what we do is we put the tissues into solutions of a bunch of healthy proteins. And after shaking and incubating, what happens is, is if there are misfolded uh, proteins in that tissue, it'll cause all these other healthy proteins to misfold. And we get a vial with a bunch of misfolded proteins. Conversely, in a healthy situation, if we put healthy tissue in and shake it and incubate it, all the proteins that we had in our solution remain healthy. And then if we put gold nanoparticles in it, the gold nanoparticles interact differently. So they'll be red with the CWD misfolded protein and they'll be blue with CWD free tissue samples. And so this has given us a visual detection for chronic wasting disease. And it is the first field deployable test of its record on kind. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, the next speaker will be Colin Gray from chemistry. Understanding plasma chemistry using lightning to make products. <laughs> The U.S. produces nearly 20 billion tons of chemical waste annually, and this is because many chemical reactions require the use of waste, the production of waste, and that is because we place chemicals into an initial vat, we run the reaction, we take what we need, and then there's something left over, and many of these leftover chemicals make their way into our environment, harming us and the wildlife around us. Now, one way to remove this waste at the end is by minimizing the use of chemicals at the beginning. But that's not as easy as it sounds, because many of these chemicals produce, even though they end up as waste, they provide energy to this system. They produce a chemical environment that runs these reactions. And so you may be thinking, how can we put this energy into a system but minimize the use of chemicals? And the answer to that is plasma. Plasma is energized gas. It's lightning, the aurora borealis, the static electricity that will drive us nuts over this winter. These are all forms of plasma, and they have energy that can drive these chemical reactions. And what's very nice about plasma as well is that this energy can come from green resources, such as wind energy, solar, or water energy that can be put into a chemical reaction and then drive to make the products that we need. And the ultimate result, the waste that we form is just air. And so we've minimized the need for chemical waste at the end of these reactions. Now you may be asking, why don't we just use plasma for all of these reactions to run everything? It's because we don't know how plasma runs in many reactions. We don't understand the mechanisms for what is allowing us to take plasma and drive these useful chemical reactions. So my project, is working to understand the environment and the mechanisms that take this energized gas and push it into useful chemical products in the end. And currently, I have discovered that many reactions that require oxidation or just adding an oxygen or a chain to, uh, of chemicals require, uh, is impacted greatly by the amount of salt or environmentally benign salt in this environment of these reactions. And in moving forward, I'm looking to understand how these reactions undergo in the trillionths of seconds in the first interaction between this plasma and the chemical environment using ultrafast spectroscopy. And this is just small particles of light interacting at ultrafast speeds to measure how we make those changes. 
And so in, with my work, I hope to understand how plasma drives useful chemical reactions to minimize chemical waste and make sure that we can build these uh, systems so that we can make useful and environmentally friendly chemicals in the future. Will be Pauline and Ezer. We're going to hear it. We'll talk about decoding blood brain barrier dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. Can you hear me? Okay. 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 Go. My grandpa Julius was an avid reader. In the evenings, he would recline into his favorite chair and often pick up the most recent issue of Scientific American. But in the later years of his life, when he sat down to read, he was opening Cowboys and Cowgirls, yippee -ay. Now, what took him from Scientific American to a children's book was Alzheimer's disease. Now, this didn't happen overnight. Rather, there were likely tons of small changes happening in his brain while he was still reading Scientific American. And that's actually the case for most Alzheimer's patients in that there are small, subtle changes that begin up to decades before the onset of dementia. And my thesis is trying to better understand those changes so that we can intervene before the disease develops into dementia. Now, these early changes largely involve the blood-brain barrier. Think of the blood-brain barrier as the gatekeeper of the brain. It carefully controls what's able to enter and exit the brain, and it does this to keep brain cells happy and healthy. In Alzheimer's disease, though, the gatekeeper is caught sleeping on the job. And I'm trying to figure out with my research what causes this gatekeeper to fall asleep, and how do we wake them back up? We know that there's no single cause of Alzheimer's. It's a combination of an individual's genetic and non-genetic risk factors that come together that, to determine an individual's disease progression. And so it's not clear, however, how those combined factors drive these early blood-brain barrier changes. And that's what I'm studying. So I'm in the lab and I can take, I make miniature blood-brain barrier models that are formed from the stem cells of individuals with different genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease, and even from Alzheimer's patients themselves. I make those barriers, I compare their function, and I've already been identifying some genes that cause weaker barriers to form. I'm now starting to add in the non-genetic factors so I can see the interplay between the genetic and non-genetic risk. And this allows me to identify what are the main factors that are the most damaging? And what are the changes that we likely want to start targeting? And ultimately, we'd like to use this information to inform new drug targets that can modify the disease trajectory early on so that the next time a grandpa picks up cowboys and cowgirls, yippee yay, it's to read it to his grandchildren. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Kapanja Note. Uh, how bacteria taught me to leave no one behind is from chemical engineering. Can you work? I think so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, right. So all of us have different heights. Some of us are taller than others, while some of us are shorter. Now, we all came into this room to listen to the three minute thesis competition at about the same time. No matter what our height is, no matter how tall or short we are, it takes us about the same time to go from one place to another. For us, while walking at the same speed as others and keeping up with them may not be a big concern, but for bacteria in the microscopic world, not being able to keep up with others can be a matter of life and death. 
half the cells in our own body are actually bacterial cells. So if we if bacteria don't survive, we don't survive. Just like us, in a community of bacteria, there are members of different sizes. And just as diversity makes us powerful as a community, a colony of bacteria also needs this diversity of different size members to better fight against threats. Thus, if a group of bacteria is traveling from one place to another in search of food or shelter, it is absolutely necessary that all the bacteria of different sizes travel together. Now bacteria have these pickle-shaped bodies and they move around using those thin hair-like propellers. Now, a larger bacteria, while it moves, faces more resistance and thus has a risk of getting, slowing down and getting left behind from the smaller members of this community. So then how do bacteria maintain their diversity while traveling? To find this out in my research, I became an athletics coach for bacteria. I held races between bacteria under the microscope. And surprisingly, in these races, everybody was the winner. <clears throat> no matter how large or small, all bacteria moved at the same speed. And to find, this, uh, find out why what was going on, just as a coach would look at the individual performances of their the athletes, I looked at what each individual bacteria was doing. And what we found is that the larger bacteria, which face more resistance, more adversity while moving, grow these extra propellers, which gives them power, more power to move. And as a result of that, they can move and keep up with their smaller members. Thus, my research has helped us find how bacteria have overcome adversities and have survived on this planet for billions of years. They have taught me another important lesson. In the long hours of PhD research in these cold Minnesota winters, it's very important that we look out for each other so that no one gets left behind. Thank you. Multi-legged quantum transistors is from physics. Testing does work. Okay. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So we all use a computer in our daily life, such as your mobile phone. Now the computing part in these computers is done by the processor, which is just a microchip the size of your thumb. Now a single microchip can host a billion of transistors and a single transistor is about thousand times smaller than your hair. So it is this miniaturization of this transistor that has made modern computers so powerful compared to past computers. So a single transistor is nothing but a switch. It switches between on and off or zero and one forming the classical bit of your computer. Now, if you want to make modern computers even more powerful, we have to shrink this transistor even more. So can we do that? Yes, we can. But there comes some problem with that. So if you make the transistor really small, we hit a quantum limit. And when we hit the quantum limit, the transistor is not going to function the way it is supposed to. So to, in order to get ahead of the curve, we can exploit this quantum effects to build a new type of computer called a quantum computer. Now, a quantum computer may be really useful for some problems such as drug discovery, cryptography, and many other complex computing problems. So in my research, in order to help build this quantum computer, I make this uh, multi-legged quantum transistor, an image of which you can see on the screen. And these transistors are then put on a microchip, which, is, which doesn't look exactly the same as the one in your phone, but it's our microchip. And then to really manipulate these quantum states, we put this microchip in a fridge. Now these fridges, they get really, really cold. How cold? About 30,000 times colder than your typical Minnesota winter. And when things are that cold, we can exploit the quantum states to build a qubit. Now a qubit uses the quantum states to form zeros and ones. And then it, it can manipulate those zeros and ones uh, in a highly parallelizable way. 
and that may allow us to solve some more complex problems. Thank you. Next we have Gerada Sigar, uh, who is from Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. And the title of her talk is Scan, We Help Lift the Weight of Water. Testing, if everybody can hear me. Yes. If I ask you to take a look at those two images on the left and identify the case where the water body has expanded due to land degradation as opposed to true flooding, you will probably do that pretty easily and pick out the top image as the correct one. Now, if I ask you to repeat a similar task by looking at this brain scan and tell me if the water bodies of the brain or the ventricles have expanded due to a true excess of cerebrospinal fluid or due to the death of the surrounding brain tissue, the problem is not so trivial anymore. It so happens that this is the scan of a patient with idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus or NPH, which can be reversed by inserting a shunt into the ventricles and diverting the excess fluid either into the heart or the abdominal cavity, much like what you would do when redirecting floodwaters. This disease causes symptoms such as dementia and trouble with walking, which may lead to falls, especially in older adults. And it's also caused by irreversible dementia, such as Alzheimer's dementia, as well as chronic brain injury. So it is extremely important to identify these patients correctly and treat them if we can. My thesis is doing exactly that in three different ways. First, I've developed semi-automatic methods to measure how much these water bodies of the brain or the ventricles have expanded in comparison to the surrounding landmass or the brain tissue, which is very much what we would do when solving a classification problem like that. Um, it so happens that these features are able to reasonably distinguish between not NPH and Alzheimer's dementia, but they are not able to do it very sensitively. The sensitivity is low. So I'm looking at developing machine learning algorithms to encode those subtle patterns of brain deterioration that may not always be captured by explicit programming or we cannot quantitate them easily. And finally, I'm looking at how the brain deteriorates in NPH over time in comparison to Alzheimer's disease to see if there are any early brain changes and signs that we can use to diagnose these people and treat them better. So the impact of my project, if successful, is going to be threefold. First, I'm using non-contrast computed tomography scans, which are more affordable, accessible, and quicker as compared to their magnetic resonance imaging counterparts. And second, it's going to be as automated as possible, which means we are going to be eliminating observer variability, and we may also help enable large-scale screening with low time and cost. And finally, if this algorithm is successful, we may be able to identify patients with NPH and literally help lift the weight off of their heads. Thank you. Molly Kasar, Biomedical Engineering, and the title is Getting to the Heart of Cardiac Growth During Pregnancy. Passing? Good. Hopefully, there's a link. Like all of you, I am the result of a pregnancy. Oh, really, you can ask my mom. In fact, for nine long months, her body adapted to accommodate my proper growth and development including her heart, which grew by about 30%. If, actually, if you ask her this next part, she'll absolutely deny it, but um, eventually it did shrink back, but she says that it didn't because her heart is just filled with too much love for me. <laughs> then her heart adapted again and again for both of my sisters, but the very last time she was pregnant, her heart didn't adapt like it was supposed to. And I almost lost her and my brother to a really severe case of undiagnosed preeclampsia or high blood pressure that only happens during pregnancy. Unfortunately, my mom's story is far too common. Cardiovascular conditions like preeclampsia are currently the leading causes of pregnancy-related deaths in the United States. But before we can really think about how we can bring those numbers down or why pregnancy even triggers these conditions, we need to ask ourselves, 
how does the heart even know it's supposed to grow during pregnancy or when it's supposed to grow? Which is exactly what I'm exploring through my research. But this isn't the easiest task because during pregnancy, there are a lot of really big changes happening during a really short period of time and the whole entire body is working together to make sure that's happening. And it's impossible to isolate any of these cues driving these changes, any of these messages, because if we do that, we could disrupt fetal development or even prevent pregnancy from happening in the first place. However, I can use computational modeling to non-invasively investigate how these different messages might come together and tell the heart that it's time to grow. Luckily, a lot of researchers before me have looked into what tells the heart that it's time to grow before, or in, before pregnancy even happens, mostly in mice and rats. And so I can take what I know has told the heart to grow before, and I can consider that for my model. So for example, I know that changes in how much blood is circulating throughout the body tells the heart to grow, and I can add that in. But by itself, that's not enough information. Uh, but if I add in things like blood pressure and hormones, I'm actually able to capture how the heart grows and it shows us what we see in real life. When I, um, and I'm also able to do that for rats that develop high blood pressure during pregnancy, which is really exciting. And this allows us to think about how and when we should be screening patients for conditions like preeclampsia so that we can diagnose and treat them before we actually see any real changes. So even though I can't go back in time and rewrite my mom's story, I can make sure that I can use my research to prevent other mothers from having the same outcome in the future. Thank you. Next speaker is Philip Holloway from mechanical engineering, how to drive faster and further on Mars. Can you hear me? Yes. If I were to ask you to picture a vehicle driving around on Mars, what would you think of? And how fast is it going? If your first thought maybe is like in the movie, The Martian, uh, Mark Watney drives pretty fast across the surface of Mars um, in his buggy. But in reality, Martian rovers are actually really slow, um, like painfully slow, because, because of how difficult the terrain is. Um, Curiosity's max speed is a football field in an hour. That is very slow when you're trying to get places and do interesting research. And the main reason for that slowness is because Mars is covered in sharp and pointy rocks that really want to poke your tires, damage your tires, and slow you down. So that's why my research is on improving the design of Martian rover tires. So what we wanna do is we wanna move away from the current metal tires that are very stiff and solid and easy to break. And we wanna to move to flexible mesh-like metal tires. How do we make a mesh-like metal tire? Step one is we use a super elastic metal. What is that? Um, essentially super elasticity means it's a very stretchy metal, relatively speaking. Um, a normal material, say like steel, when you bend it, it's only gonna bend a tiny bit before it starts permanently to form, but a super elastic alloy actually is gonna bend a lot, 10, more than 10 times as much without any permanent deformation and still spring back. And that's very useful when you're trying to design flexible metal tires. Step two is we take that flexible metal wire and we knit it into textiles. And yes, that's knitting like clothes knitting, but with metal wire and on a larger scale. Uh, the majority of my research is actually on designing the patterns and the manufacturing techniques for making these flexible metal tires um, to get the or flexible metal textiles to get the most out of these. Um, <laughs> in terms of good material properties. That's important because we can design the shape of these textiles to get a property called oxesis out of them. So what is oxesis? If you think of a, a normal material, say like a rubber band, when I stretch it, it actually um, contracts a little bit in the middle, but an exotic material, when you stretch it, actually expands in the middle, which is very weird, not something you see every day. But that's useful because in an exotic textile, when I push on it, it actually draws material in around that point of contact and that better distributes the load across the structure. And that's very useful as you can imagine when you're trying to drive over things like pointy rocks. Um, so really what we're doing is we're combining the super elastic property of the metal and the exotic structure of the textile to make very strong yet still very flexible metal tires. And really this is useful for a lot more than just driving on Mars. Um, this research sets the stage for further research on really any flexible structure 
that needs to absorb impacts repeatedly. And that can be anything from, of course, like driving here on earth, but also things like shoe insoles, where you wanna absorb the impact of walking around all day to reduce back pain. And so really this research um, on flexible metal textiles is useful for driving around on Mars and also so much more. Thank you. Next speaker is Gidia Mulat from Civil Engineering. The title is In the Smet Satellite See Through Snow. Hello. Good. Okay, thanks. Do you all remember doing this experiment in your childhood where you would take a coin and put it inside a glass filled with water and suddenly the coin seems to float? but in reality, it is still at the bottom of the glass. So what is happening there? Our eyes are getting tricked by this phenomenon of refraction. This similar phenomenon creates problem for the NASA's SMAP satellite when it tries to observe soil moisture on snow covered surfaces. So let me take a step back and introduce you all to the satellite. SMAP satellite was launched in 2015 by NASA with a mission to provide soil moisture information across the globe. And since then, this satellite is playing a critical role in providing soil moisture information and helping weather forecasters predict flash floods, farmers growing more crops and communities better plan for drought. However, at present, it is hard to detect soil moisture when there is snow on the surface because snow distorts the signal coming from the soil in a very similar fashion as water distorts the signal coming from the coin. More specifically, if we ignore the effects of soil uh, snow on, this, uh, uh, on the emission signal, then we are prone to underestimate the value of soil moisture significantly. And that is why right now there is no algorithm which could help SMAP detect soil moisture on snow covered surfaces. And this is where my research comes into picture. We developed the first ever emission model relating the physical properties of soil, snow, and vegetation to, to the signal observed by the satellite. And it turns out that by using this model, we can actually observe soil moisture with below snowpack with an accuracy as good as observing soil moisture without snowpack. And the figure here on the right side of the slide shows the ability of our algorithm in retrieving over areas where it was not possible by SMAP to retrieve earlier. Hence, this product increases the, uh, uh, increases the probability of observing soil moisture especially in the Northern Hemisphere, where for almost 30% of the time, the satellite was unable to give us data. Now one might ask, how does this uh, increased ability help us in our day-to-day -day lives? I am sure you all must have heard that Mississippi River gets flooded every year during spring. And it happens and it is happening more often than ever. So in this case, if we already know the soil moisture below snowpack, we can estimate the capacity of soil to absorb the snow melt water and eventually estimate how much water is going to end up down the stream. This helps in generating early flood warnings even before more standard indicators are triggered. Not only this, soil moisture below snowpack has, is very sensitive to climate change and it shows more visible signatures for long-term carbon sink. So this research would help the community <laughs> in advancing and understanding and adapting to the future challenges of climate change. Thank you. The low mass galaxies and the mass Metallicity relation, sorry. Hello. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so here are two galaxies. One is large and spiral, just like the one we have. So I'm going to call them the normal galaxy. The other one is small and compact. This is the low mass galaxy. So what is so special about the low mass galaxy? Um, they are smaller, so fainter. So it's harder to find the low mass galaxy. But we have already found there are more low mass galaxy than the normal galaxies. And also galaxy will grow bigger by time. 
So the low mass galaxy is the starting point of galaxy evolution. Now, when galaxies grow larger over time, the stars in a galaxy will turn hydrogen into heavier elements like oxygen and ion. We just call them metal. And the ratio between the metal to the hydrogen is the metallicity. We found that the higher the mass of the galaxy, then the higher the metallicity. This is so-called the mass metallicity relation. It's one of the tracer of the galaxy evolution. So when we look at all the galaxies on the sky and we saw that there's this mass metallicity relation, it's actually not just telling us that different galaxies will behave differently. It's also suggesting that the low mass galaxy will grow its mass along with the mass metallicity relation. So this relation is actually a trajectory of galaxy evolution. And I can explain this evolution expecting, with expecting that there's a balance between how many gas flows into the galaxy and how much of these gas turn into stars and how much of these gas eventually escape from the galaxy. If such balance exists, then we will also see that once we know the mass and metallicity, we should be able to estimate how fast a star are formed in the galaxy. And that is true for the normal galaxy we found, as long as you know the mass and metallicity, you have an idea of how fast a star are formed in this galaxy. But that is not true for the low mass galaxy. And why is that? First explanation we can say is that it's easier to drive away for low mass galaxy away from the balance because they are so small. But also maybe that these low mass galaxy have never reached the balance, just like the normal galaxy. Thank you. Next talk will be heard by Keish Akshay from the community. I'm inspired early robot. Imagine there's people trapped in a mine, hundred feet underground. There's no food, no water, and they are running out of oxygen. Can we wait for a bulky excavation machine to get set up and dig the ground? Conventional drilling machines are expensive, cause damage to the environment, and above all, consume high amounts of energy due to soil removal. How do we solve these problems? Turns out, nature already has all the answers. Inspired by nature's most efficient soil explorers, plant roots, and earthworms, the Mechanical Energy and Power Systems Lab at the University of Minnesota is building a bio-inspired burrowing robot. This robot navigates around rocks instead of drilling through them, saving time and energy. The robot compresses the soil instead of removing soil like drilling systems. It comprises of a head, a front segment, an extending segment, and a rear segment. When a plant root grows in hard soil, it expands at the root tip. Taking cue from this, we have built a novel two-step morphing head that changes its shape. In the first step, a slender head makes a small hole in the ground. In the second step, the head expands, cracks the soil, and enlarges the hole, creating space for the robot body to move. The locomotion of our robot is inspired by the movement of earthworms. Like an earthworm, the front and rear segments expand and contract alternatively. The extending segment can push and pull. Combining these movements, the robot travels underground. The innovative morphing head and the flexible robot body work in tandem to propel the robot. Compared to heads of existing robots, the morphing head consumes 30% less energy. So we are not only saving lives, our, our robot can also protect the environment, saving energy. 
it will find applications in installing and repairing underground pipes, space exploration, detecting minerals, and rescue missions. Our robot has the potential to replace traditional drilling systems and completely revolutionize the way humans explore the depths of the earth. Thank you and have a good evening. I didn't even turn it on. Hi, Rikhanan Ibrahimi of Civil Engineering. Can deep learning machines outperform weather prediction models? Sound okay? Well, is it good? Yeah. It's on the top. Hi. Okay. Floods are number one natural disaster in the United States in terms of live loss and property damage, with the average cost of $4.7 billion per event. I'm sure all of you heard about Hurricane Katrina and its devastating effect. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina get the life of 2,000 people and caused $125 billion property damage. And only 20 days ago in Florida, Hurricane Ian got the, killed 120 people. The main cause of these floods are heavy rainfall, which are usually uh, predicted by numerical physics-based model. But these models have their own uncertainties. Here I'm showing you uh, the output of two different models for Hurricane Ian. The red contours show the GFS model, which is developed by NOAA, and the right contours show the ECMWF models developed by Europeans. You can see that there is a disagreement between the center of the hurricane that these two models are predicting. So these uh, uncertainties make it critical for us to develop a more reliable uh, prediction models that can help us to be more prepared for these natural disasters. Another source of data for weather forecasting is satellite data. On the image on the left, you can see the GPM satellite, one of the NASA satellite for uh, measuring precipitation. And as you can see, it captured the hurricane very well. But the problem is that, with that is the satellite takes time to capture the event, process the data, and send the data to the Earth. So we cannot use those data directly for our purpose. And that's where my research comes into place. The IMERS is one of the GPM products that uh, calibrate and combine the data from 12 different satellites and provide precipitation map 30, uh, every 30 minutes. But uh, still there is a, a problem with the latency. It has a latency of four hours, which means the latest available map is for four hours ago. So these data, which limits their applicability for the uh, real-time applications, like when we need to act quickly. In order to solve this problem, I use 12 sequence of IMERS data, feed them to a network, and make the network to predict uh, 10 steps ahead, like five hours ahead. And by doing so, I was able, uh, this network has this convolutional STM uh, cells that make it, uh, possible to capture the spatial and temporal resolution um, of the storm. And it was shown that we can outperform the physics-based model, the GFS model, when we want to predict up to three and a half hours ahead. So there is a potential to use this state-of-the-art deep learning model uh, to develop a warning system and save life and property. Thank you. Next speaker is Basu Roy from chemistry. Title is Ian and Tana. Okay, all right. Okay. The structure of our heart the composition of our blood, the design of our bones. 
all this crucial information is present in our genes. In the past few decades, we have made great discoveries about our genetics. Today, we know we have about 25,000 genes, as well as we know the function of each of these genes. Now, this information has allowed us to pinpoint exactly which malfunctioning genes cause genetic disorders such as hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, and many more. We have treatments available to alleviate the pain and suffering caused by these genetic disorders, but we do not have a cure yet. But gene therapy offers a promising future. In theory, we can permanently cure these genetic disorders if you are able to replace this malfunctioning gene with the correct one. But the problem is getting the right DNA inside the cells. DNA is unstable. It, is not, it cannot be injected into the blood directly. Neither, is it, uh, neither can our cells accept it as it is. So we need to develop a carrier that can bind with the DNA, stabilize it, and help it get inside the cells. I promise you that the solution for this problem probably resides in tonic water. If you have drank tonic water before, you are probably familiar with this bitter taste. That bitterness is due to a molecule called quinine. Now, the uniqueness of quinine lies in its exceptional ability to bind with the DNA. And what can bind to DNA better than just one molecule of quinine? That will be multiple quinine molecules chemically stitched together. In my PhD, I'm making large molecules called as polymers by stitching together multiple quinine molecules in different shapes, sizes, and compositions. I have found that these polymers of quinine can bind with the DNA, wrap themselves around it, and form these small particles that are as small as a virus. Inside these particles, the DNA remains stable and the cells are able to accept DNA in this form much more efficiently. I've also found that not all these polymers work equally well, but each of these polymers have their own advantages and shortcomings. But I'm optimistic that with carefully designing and making improved version of these polymers, we'll be able to overcome these shortcomings. So next time you're enjoying a cocktail of gin and tonic, remember that this molecule in your drink is helping to bring affordable gene therapy one step closer to reality. Thank you. Big data, big promise, simple blood test to assess Alzheimer's disease risk. I'm ready. Hello. Let me thank you all for a time travel adventure to the year 2050. Most of us in this room will be over 60 to 65 years old. If I tell you, more than 10% of us in this room can remember our names, can recognize our near and dear ones or can't even move around or drive ourselves. How do you feel about it? Does it shock you? It really shocked me. That is Alzheimer's dementia, also known as AD dementia. It is a progressive disease. What does that mean? You will not have any symptoms in the early stages of AD. It all starts with some high cognitive impairment and before you even realize you have AD dementia. So early detection is the key. Now let's come back to the year 2022 and see how we can detect AD. We have two options. One is PET brain scan, that is considered as a gold standard to diagnose AD dementia, and it's very expensive. On an average, it can cost you anywhere from $5,000 to $8,000 per scan. Or the second option would be to do spinal tap to test fluid from your brain, and it's an invasive surgical procedure. You can imagine how many of us can afford it or do it even if we can afford it. So what we can do about it? Our memories are so precious to cherish. So there must be a way out. After all, we are living in the era of machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, genomics, and all those cool buzzwords we hear a lot. My research focuses on identifying key genomic features that can predict Alzheimer's dementia in early adulthood from blood samples using advanced artificial intelligence. 
For the first time ever, we have access to large scale, high dimensional omics data. All those omics you see on the screen, we obtain those by molecular profiling of human genome. Using this data, I have developed an explainable machine learning model that can predict AD dementia in early adulthood. This model allowed us to identify those key hidden genomic factors that can predict co-allied high risk of developing AD dementia. The model we developed is generalizable across various ethnic cohorts in US. The findings from my study will give insights to develop new blood-based clinical tests for population screening. This test would cost you only a fraction compared to a PET scan, and it doesn't require an invasive surgical procedure. Let's all cherish our memories. Thank you. Okay, that was the final talk. Oh. Okay, um, thank you once again. From all the speakers, I thank the judges who I think have been working hard thinking about all of these talks. I think you can go to the neighboring room and put up here and in the symbol. <laughs> Or you can uh, use this Z link to access the People's Choice voting app uh, and enter your votes. And this should also be accessible to our Zoom audience. I lost that connection. Um, no. Whatever. Oh, we can do it too. Oh, yeah. At least one more. Is this working? Okay, great. And at this time, uh, oops, my book can be bought. How much? I would say I'll do it for two minutes. I'm going to show you this. We have 46 people watching online. We are only happy about it. Does anyone have questions for any of our speakers? Oops, I can't see the No, no, she just went to the next They had a little bit of a change. Okay, I've got a question. Yeah, there's no like, it's not like under our You can drop the room mics. Just keep open. The mic's up here. Otherwise, I, there's a lot of feedback. Yeah, so any questions for the speakers? If not, I can ask a couple of questions. And um, one, I will ask Cody Carr. Getting bad feedback. So my field is fluid dynamics and I care about inflows and outflows. And you said that by adding a turbulence model, we're better able to match, uh, I think, simulated results. So how does the turbulence model change your results? So my outflow model assumes a speed for the bulk flow and outflow. So when we fit that to data that includes that bulk motion plus turbulence, 
our fit, you know, is fitting the velocity field without the turbulence. So it's going to be actually shifted by um, amounts that's equivalent to the size of the turbulence motion. So then, um, you know, when we put it back in, we have to essentially shift back and correct for it. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, how strong is the turbulence compared to the bulk flow? Yeah, so that's, so this is a radiation transfer model and that matters uh, a lot actually for our approximations, but the turbulence may be like 10 kilometers per second. And uh, the outflow um, will grow from example, like 30 kilometers per second to about 500 kilometers per second. And actually, you know, the area where this matters is in the low velocity area where the turbulence is per, you know, close to the size of the bolt. Thanks. You have questions? Yeah, I have a question for the, the Broering uh, robot. Yeah. Um, so how large is the robot? And I wish you have a video because we cannot show the video. And, uh, that's the thing, see. right? I have to yeah. explain with my hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you have a video yeah. of the robot that can show us? Uh, oh, yeah. There's a YouTube video I can share if you want. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And how large is it? So including, excluding the head, it's about this big. And including the head, we expect it to be like a couple of feet. So the, the robot that... Does the drill is uh, about the size of the piece? Yeah, something. it's like an inch and a half diameter. That's pretty large. Yeah, it's like this much. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can. Maybe he can bring up the uh, the YouTube on screen there. I don't know if that's possible right now. Can I do it? Is there a way to do it? Try. <laughs> <laughs> so it's on the ME website. Uh, I think we'll see if it's causal in the blood brain barrier, the yeah. stuff you found. Yeah. 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 I just see what the link is. Yeah. 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 If not, I'm going to keep it. Yeah. <laughs> I got a question. Good. So, on the chronic wasting disease, gold nanoparticles, yes. what is it that causes the color change and how do you get it to react to those particular overfolded proteins? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so, with the gold nanoparticles, the color change comes from the fact that if you shoot light at the gold nanoparticle, uh, they absorb light differently depending on their diameter. But the thing is, if, is if you can cause the gold nanoparticles to clump together, that's effectively kind of, you can think about it like changing the diameter. And so what that does is then that changes the color. So our test utilizes, um, basically makes the gold nanoparticles clump together in one sense in one scenario and not clump together in the other. And so the way that that works is uh, the healthy proteins that I was talking about, they bind really, really well to the gold nanoparticles and they act almost like a glue that clumps them together. And then when I blast light at it and look at it with my eye, um, then that causes that color shift. But in the, uh, the case with the misfolded protein, uh, they just, they don't interact with the gold nanoparticles. The, the way they're folded, um, when they clump together, they change concentration. And so there's just not as much of them. And that's actually, it's causing that. So yeah, it was kind of a neat trick we discovered on accident, but yeah, it, it works. So we're really excited to see where it goes. So yeah. have you had anyone like, is it like because of external thiol, like bonding to the gold or have you had anyone look at like the chemistry of what is? Yeah. To it? So what I think it is, is, uh, my gold nanoparticles are negatively charged. Okay. And the, the pH that I'm working in of the proteins, the proteins are positively, the healthy proteins are positively charged. Interesting. So I, I literally think it's just a negative and a positive and bang. Yeah. There we go. Cool. So that's kind of where I'm at. So yeah. It's, oh, it's it keeps me, keeps me <laughs> Yes. I have another question for here. 
Um, have you thought about using the gold nanoparticles in another type of prion or protein misfolding disease? Yeah, that's that's a fantastic question. I actually, you got, I was I was running out of time. I was like, oh, I wish I had thirty more seconds. <laughs> um, so so we saw some Alzheimer's uh, testing or some Alzheimer's diseases, and part of Alzheimer's disease is this misfolding. Um, so there might be some applications in trying to get uh trying to get diagnostics for uh, misfolding disease like Alzheimer's or maybe something like Parkinson's, which also has these protein misfoldings in it. So um, we're kind of using chronic wasting disease as like a model because frankly, it's a lot easier to work with those tissues than human samples. Um, but then we're hoping to take what we learned there and, and adapt it. Yeah, great question, fantastic. So yeah, we'll see, I'm excited. Yeah. I'll ask a question about snow uh, application with sensing. So it's so you're scanning from a satellite. Is it a radar? No, it's passive. It's passive microwave satellites. Microwaves. Yeah. And so I assume that you make some adjustment due to the fact that you have this layer of snow. So, uh, uh, and does it depend on the depth of the snow? So oh, it doesn't take a girl. Yeah, so my problem was about rainfall precipitation. So the satellite, the maps that is provided is like the rate of rainfall near the surface. So we use the sequence of those maps to predict like sequence ahead. I think Divya was the, the snow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So the you're trying to visualize through the snow. You're yes. sensing through the snow. It was worse. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was my so it is it is L band microwave at 1.4 gigahertz of frequency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a, a microwave mm -hmm. frequency. Right. And so you said it's a refraction problem. Yeah. And my question is, does the depth of snow matter yeah. when you're trying to make this adjustment? Yeah, so that's a very good question because depth of snow will matter if, uh, for, for, first of all, at L-band, everything is very transparent, including atmosphere, including snow. Everything is transparent. That is why we can sense the soil moisture using L-band. So snow is also transparent because it does not have absorption or scattering at L band because the uh, wavelength is very large. Mm -hmm. So it does not, the snow particles does not scatter that wavelength. Mm -hmm. So it does not have scattering. It does not have absorption. The only thing happens is that the dielectric constant changes from soil to snow and then atmosphere. So this is just the change of media. Mm -hmm. So refraction occurs because yeah. whenever there is change of media, refraction occurs. This is a refraction problem. Depth of snow will matter in a case if it is wet snow because wet snow will also have water in it. So then uh, the depth will depend that, I mean, depth will calculate how much water is in the soil, uh, snow, then it will affect the signal as well. So yeah. right. for dry snow, it will not affect, it will just be the refraction. So it's really good in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not so good in some places. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? <laughs> 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 I have a question. This is actually for anyone that does work with data from satellites. Is that data typically put in a public repository that you then access, or it's very different from biological data? So I'm just curious, how do you get it? Um, I yeah. kind of adjust to this depending on the. I guess grants that you're given or uh, uh, time that you're given. Uh, there's certain conditions for like 
whether it becomes immediately public or you have like six months of exclusive access for it. Um, eventually, usually all of it will go into a public database. Um, something like the James Webb Space Telescope in the first six months, all of the time or like all of the observation data was exclusively for the people that kind of worked on it so they could get their science and their papers out. Um, so there were a couple of cases of people like writing out an entire paper and then publishing it like right after the data came out because they just plug it in and then send it to the publication. But um, yeah, usually it ends up becoming public, but there's like an exclusive period. Mm -hmm. So how do your databases work? You have to we're collecting our own data. Most all your own data. Yeah, but there are public databases as well. We usually have to submit a request to like the NIH or the repository. Usually, a bigger challenge is navigating the websites that they have set up because <laughs> usually they were last updated in like nineteen ninety five. Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are websites, but not that many. <laughs> The Alzheimer's disease folks, do you see any potentials for therapeutics? Like, I know that's not specifically what you're targeting, um, but is there anything on the horizon? Like, I mean, it's a nasty disease. And like, once you got it, you're kind of done. Like, so is there any, like, have you read any random papers, like any cool drugs that are coming out or um, cool, neat techniques that are? Drugs came out recently, the balanumab or something, okay. FDA approved it and there were a lot of criticism about it. Mm -hmm. it, re it removes your, if I understood it correctly, it removes your amyloid plates, sure. but it doesn't remove your symptoms. Mm. So, <laughs> so then people are now studying whether amyloid plates, which as you said, it yeah. can be due to like various diseases, right? Yeah. So whether that is the only pathway or why people are having symptoms. So it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. And now oh, I think so Lily is making a new drug. Interesting. Yeah. And even yeah. if you address the amyloid beta problem, there are tons of changes in the blood brain barrier alone right. that are independent of it. Right. And that's, I mean, it's, you know, so you're confident. Yeah. So there probably won't be like this single thing. Right. But that's the advantage of maybe looking earlier. Right. So, yeah, the early detection and figure out what we're talking about. Well, not in the early. Yeah, I also mentioned my comment. Congratulations. I've come to a decision. Thank you very much, graduates. And the first place prize goes to Paulina Eberts. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Very nice. Thank you. Second place prize goes to Nitish Bhakti. And we have the People's Choice Award. Goes to give you come on. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, especially, I would like to wish Paulina luck as she moves on to the next phase of competition. It'll be November 11th. Um, I should advance like that. I think that's you. Yes, uh, <laughs> I recall correctly, it's a Friday, and um, I think you're going to do great. Uh, so I hope you advance even further. And thanks everyone else for the great presentations. I think I know I really learned a lot. <laughs>